should be said before, vinyl records, right? Vinyl records, that's cool, they have vinyl records here. <laughs> Um, well, first of all, it's a, a really um, treat that um, two of the men that edited my first book are here, AJ and George. Um, and um, I got started, I'll tell you how that all started. I was working um, uh, for the state, and uh, I was a social worker, and there was never any closure, I hate that word, but there was never any closure or anything. I'd have these families for years. And it wasn't that I made them worse. It's just everybody had the same thing. And I discovered if you helped one family out of 100, you're probably really doing well. And most of them uh, were, were drug addicts. And drug addicts, what they usually do best is relapse. So there wasn't much progress. And it's year after year the same thing. And my administration was probably worse than the cases. It was a depressing job, i got to tell you. <laughs> so um, in... Um, probably the early 70s, I started taking photographs, and I now still feel like this guy scammed me. I brought some travel photographs to a lab in Elizabeth, and he said, wow, those are really good, you have a good eye. And he probably tells everybody that, so they have their developing gun there. So I started um, with black and white, because I'd all my life been going to, uh, to a teenage years on to museums and galleries, and I wanted to be a painter, but couldn't draw that well, so I thought, well, if I take a photograph, it's at least going to look like what it is. M maybe the composition won't be good, but if I practice a lot, it'll get better. And um, after a while, I was looking in galleries, and I saw that you can't have a random um, group of things to show. You have to have a theme, the same with the museums. And a logical move was for me to start photographing tattooed people, because I had a, a real interest in that. I had gotten tattooed myself in 1958, before it was trendy. <laughs> and um, I had a board, and I lived in Cranford, a town very similar to Metuchen. Not, not much going on, and um, well, I don't know how it was exciting to get a tattoo. I was colorful, maybe. Um, but anyway, <laughs> it was a logical thing to do. And then after about a year of it, I thought, oh, wait a minute, maybe this could be a book, because all these people have great stories. And um, I started with a man who um, gave me a tattoo as a teenager in Newark. But this is before I knew I was doing a book. And then I had to go back to him and get his story on tape mm -hmm. and re-photograph him. And this is um, Tony Cambria back in um, 1976. I actually started a book project in 77. And um, George said something really funny at the time. He's very insightful. And he said, tell me, uh, this guy looks like somebody that um, probably did some things that are regrettable, and he somehow landed on his feet anyway, which is true. He um, had a gold mine in Newark after uh, all the shops in New York were um, um, closed. That was made illegal in uh, 1961. Allegedly over hepatitis, one reason, another is that uh, these guys weren't paying taxes or the proper amount. And so here he is in Newark, and he's got all the boroughs of Manhattan, and the Board of Health comes in, and this guy doesn't like authority. And he s says something that, um, he, um, um, he said something pretty lewd to the health inspector, and the shop was closed uh, two days later. But he still ended up in another shop making a ton of money and, and really did very well in his life in spite of the fact that the rebel that he was. Well, anyway, this is him years later with his son, who was almost the age that he was in the first one. Um, the other thing I had a, an opportunity to do, because this took so long, I, I'm not a full-time photographer. I had um, the lovely job in social work with the people that were failing. So I was always working on this, and I had a family, and I couldn't say to my kids, oh, listen, I'm not going to make that little league game today because I'm going to New York to photograph a guy with a tattooed face. So it, and also publishers didn't want to even hear about this. <coughs> it was so far ahead of my time in the 90s, they, um, they wouldn't even listen to me. Um, so what I, I did was I had the opportunity, and I wish I'd done more of them, 
there were seven people in here that I did a second portrait from seven years to 20 some years later to see how they aged, to see how their environment changed, uh, to see if they have more tattoos, to see if the tattoos were fading. And this is one of them. This couple um, lived in this place um, with paneling, and I thought it was kind of humorous when I, I didn't notice it at the time, but this is before Photoshop, where I might have been able to straighten their photographs out. <laughs> but I thought it was more humorous to leave them like that. And then I went back to them <coughs> seven years later, and they bought a house that also had paneling. And um, now that pictures, same pictures are still <laughs> crooked. <laughs> They've gained weight, and they were way more tattooed, and now they have a wave in their rug, too. Good job. <laughs> so um, that was one. And um, another one is um, a man that I, it was happenstance. I walked into a tattoo shop, and that's another thing I'll s say about this. Somebody said to me, how did you get these people? Well, on both of them, it was what I call tattoo people sales and tough guy sales. I had to really work hard to um, get a little portfolio together and start traveling to shops all around, saying, uh, is there anybody in here that's really heavily tattooed? And in this book, in the 70s, the only people then were tattoo artists. Now there's women that are just working in a bank that are almost covered. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe the basement of a bank. I don't think they'd be a teller. <laughs> but anyway, it was very hard. And uh, the same thing with the fighters. I, um, I'll, I'll get into that with um, Chuck Wepner, a boxer who fought Muhammad Ali, was a friend. And I started by asking him. And he said, I can't do it right now. I'm su suing Sylvester Stallone for the money I didn't get for Rocky being based on my wife. Uh, and I'm, at the time, they were doing a movie on him. And he said, but I'll do it, but I'm going to give you a couple guys. You want some tough guys? These guys are tough guys. Oh, my God. Both 10th degree black belts. And uh, they one fought underground in the 50s. Uh, the other guy did full contact matches. Um, and um, as a white person, he was the champ of Harlem. <laughs> <laughs> and well, anyway, this, um, uh, this was an accident. I, was, I went into a tattoo shop. And uh, this guy was here on the, on the uh, left. He was 23 at the time. And I asked him if I could photograph him, and I, I just did it there. And then I wanted to find him again, and I would go to tattoo conventions. That's another place where I would do tattoo people sales. And um, people always had a story. That somebody always knew something about him. And they said, oh, he was shot and killed in Arizona or uh, they found him in a swamp in Florida. So one day I went up to the uh, uh, Coney Island to photograph the uh, Mermaid Day Parade. And when it was over, I was walking around and there's a freak show. And I saw him now as a 40 year old, 17 years later. And I said to the owner, is that Kurt? And he said, yeah. And I said, I've heard that he was dead. And he said, well, a lot of the people that worked for me were dead at one time. But <laughs> that's a great story. And um, I, I'll, uh, I'll get him. And, um, and he, he actually remembered me. I'm the only person he actually ever let photograph. Um, and he said, oh, yeah, that's those stories. He said, that's why I got this bullet hole with the blood to commemorate all those stories. He said, because wherever I've moved to and wherever I moved away from, they said, we heard you got killed there. Uh, and now he was living in Brooklyn, and I was able to um, tape record his story. And I'm going to probably um, say this now, and on this, this book, um, I like to say uh, the old cliche, you can't judge a book by its cover. This guy has a master's degree in psychology, and he was a mental health counselor. And he said it was his favorite job ever until he got into fighting. And he said, I did extra work with young people. I took them to play video games that were mental patients. And I, I just loved it. And this guy also, um, surprisingly, comes from a wealthy family uh, in Seattle area, which you wouldn't realize. And he was very intelligent. Um, 
I mean, he has other issues, obviously, to tattoo his face. But and then this this man um, I met in 1980, Walter Stiglitz, uh, known in the trade as Tattoo Stiggy. He um, his goal was to get into the Guinness Book of World Records with the most tattoos, and he did at that time with um, over 5,400 designs. And uh, the mayor counted them at the time, and um, Governor uh, Kane at the time did the counting. <laughs> and um, um, I went. We, we were we remained friends from 1980, and I went back in 2002 to photograph him now in his 70s. And uh, his environment changed. He went from. Jesus is on the first page to um, grandchildren and Elvis's. <laughs> His uh, tattoos got a little grayer and he's gained some weight. And um, there was, there's another one I can find quickly that, um, or not. Um, what's that page? I don't know what's in my own book, <laughs> but there there are seven uh, people in here that are, are before and after um, types of things. Um, the the next book, actually, I'll I'm going to show some. I'm just going to show some prints from that. Um, this uh, this man's on the back cover, mm -hmm. and um, this is another surprise. If he were here and stood up, uh, you'd probably be amazed. He's 6-3 in Chinese, mm -hmm. which is unusual in itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a landscaper uh, for most of his career. And this was a um, famous guy in the bike world, Indian Larry. Uh, a friend of mine uh, is horrified. The Indian Larry died on a, in a motorcycle stunt. And his shop was taken over by his friends. And they have two of his bikes on Neiman Marcus's website for over 100000 And I said, well, Bob, don't be depressed by that, because some of the money's going to charity. <laughs> Let me say about this couple, um, an example of uh, what I was doing in the book was trying to de-stereotype the people. And I know that these people were really great. But I'm sure there are people that saw this and said, oh my God, they're raising a child? We better call the authorities. Now, when I, I met her at a tattoo convention, and I thought, wow, that's, that's really interesting. And I asked her if I could photograph her. And she said, sure, uh, come out to Philadelphia, and we'll arrange it. And the day I was going, uh, she said, um, you're coming all this way. Would you like to have dinner with us? And I said, sure, I'm homeless. I haven't had a meal in a day. And she said, it's vegetarian, like that was going to be bad. And, um, that's okay, it's free, isn't it? And uh, it was actually a very good meal that she put a lot of preparation in. And after working at, for a state agency, I was a pretty good judge of how people are with their children. You can tell uh, in the state cases who's putting an act on so that they can get their child back from foster care. Th this couple um, were so good with this child. and. Actually, he was starting to get on my nerves because I had all these cords and wires with my lights and he was getting tangled in them. And they were just so patient and loving with him. His name is Swade, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Frank Zappa would be proud of him. <laughs> and uh, this is the cover person who uh, the publisher, well, to fit on the cover, segmented it. They also, this is early digital, they removed the Marlboro pack. And I oh, yeah. the only thing they edited, it, and I said, why did you do that? And they said, because uh, we're not advertising anybody. Right. This is sort of significant, that um, the smearer, because this is, um, before he worked in a shop, he lived in the Boston area, and he carried all his tattoo equipment in that suitcase, and would come to your kitchen if you were getting a tattoo. Mm. Yeah. I, uh, unfortunately, um, this person isn't, wasn't able to make it tonight. This is my favorite photograph in the, um, in the, tattoo, uh, in the Tough Guy book. Um, and it's 
sort of serves to um, my other goal of trying to de-stereotype fighters because I've had people say to me, um, aren't you afraid to be alone with these people? And I said, well, wh what do you mean by that? Uh, they're really nice people. I, I'm not going to insult them. And if, if I did that, just ask me to leave. They're not going to start a fight unless they get paid for it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, you want to stereotype. Uh, I'm afraid to be alone with evangelical Christians in the South <laughs> and the people that worked in the banking industry <laughs> that gave the bad mortgages. Yeah. But no, and uh, this one I always say, uh, tough guys can be tender too. Yeah. Well, last week there was another signing, and he showed up with his son, who's oh. now five. His, his in-laws, his brother, his wife, and he spoke, and uh, people that were there that said they, they were a little intimidated. Um, he's only 5'5", five five, but he's, you know, as white as a Ford Focus, <laughs> and um, one of the nicest people, and he was very articulate. He's got a tri he had a triple major in college, political science, economics, and history. And he was uh, a social worker at one time, too, and he was a teacher. And he said, thanks to Governor Christie, uh, I was the um, last um, hired, first laid off. And now he's a physical fitness uh, instructor for uh, celebrities and still fighting um, in uh, mixed martial arts. And um, he, he added a lot of warmth and dispelled a lot of people's st stereotypes. Plus, he also uh, pointed out the, uh, what the training is like, and, uh, and that's another thing I'm going to say is uh, their training, because I was in uh, Florida for the last part of the book, uh, and I had to hang around there for hours every day uh, waiting for people to be available, and I would watch them, and they had 60 professionals out of this gym. It's 20,000 square feet. They would train two hours in the morning, two hours in the late afternoon, if they didn't have a fight. If they had a fight, they trained six hours a day. And it is grueling. One of the questions I asked the uh, fighters um, is um, their fear going into, uh, both boxers going into a ring, mixed martial arts guys, like this guy going into a cage. And they said, well, yeah, there's some butterflies till, till uh, the, the match starts. But we get by far more hurt in um, training because they're beating the hell out of each other all day. And they have more injuries from training. And they said, this is nothing. It's 15 minutes. You know, it's um, – mm. uh, and then there was a guy that um, – well, that, that first guy, when he was a kid, he was in a lot of street fights because he lived in Patterson. And he said um, – people say, oh, they're afraid to be in the cage. And he said, I'm thinking – this is easy. I, I had multiple opponents. They were bigger than me, and some had weapons. And here's somebody's your size, and there's a referee. What's to be afraid of? <laughs> this, this is the guy that's on the cover in a different photograph. Um, he was a um, college wrestler in uh, the state of Washington, and um, he obtained a master's in psych when he was done and was looking for something to do competitively and found uh, mixed martial arts so he could uh, use his wrestling. The gym that he was in in Florida, everybody loved him and everybody had a story about him. And um, one of them was that um, he had a white belt beginner in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, went to Abu Dhabi, which is, that's like the World Series of Jiu-Jitsu, and um, fought the champ six-degree black belt with this white belt and one in the 205-pound class. And his comment was, when I told him about it, that I heard this, he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I didn't know who Regan Machado was to be afraid of him, so I just beat him. <laughs> <laughs> um, he also fought for the Ultimate Fighting uh, Championship, a brand name, if anybody's not familiar with it. Uh, that's the biggest organization um, of mixed martial arts. In fact, there's uh, Fox Sports has the preliminaries on free tonight from 8 until 10, and then the pay-per-view comes on. But he, he's 5'9", 240 pounds, and he fought for the heavyweight championship against uh, a man who was 6'8", and 265 pounds. I saw that bout, and I said, Jeff, you, 
must have been so exciting. Uh, people were patting you on the back and high-fiving you, and uh, there were 10 million viewers at home. And uh, typical of, he's not the, he's an atypical kind of guy in this. And he said, yeah, he said, uh, that was exciting. He said, I had John Lennon's Imagine playing when I walked out. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't go with this. <laughs> and he said, I got so excited, I, I lost uh, my focus on my game plan, and I lost. <laughs> but he, he definitely fits the, my title. Uh, the uh, criterion uh, that I had was that these are people that whether they're winning or not, or you heard of them, or they're the biggest champ, or the um, guy in his first fight, is that they would not quit, no matter what. Injury wouldn't stop them, and, and he's one of those guys. He fought the champ for five five-minute rounds, and uh, he lost a decision, but he hung in there. <coughs> this guy uh, is, uh, was, uh, in his prime, an underground fighter. And that is um, essentially the same thing as the mixed martial arts without the benefit of rules <laughs> <laughs> or a referee or weight divisions or time limits. Uh, if the f match went 30 uh, minutes till somebody got knocked out or whatever happened, uh, that's the way it went. He was 36 and 0 in the underground. And uh, he was 6'3 and 240. And he said he's fought people that weighed 300 pounds. And, and this guy is, is famous in the boxing world. That's Howard Davis Jr. Um, he was, I was a big boxing fan, which led me into this book from the time I was about five. And in 74, I distinctly remember, he was in the Olympics. And it was a great human interest story in that his mother died a week before the uh, bout. And um, I, when I saw him and I asked him, um, how did you reconcile that? And he said, I was going to go home. And he was very close to his parents. And um, the coach said to him, Howard, what would your mother say? And he said, well, my mother said, win the gold. He mm -hmm. said, well, there's your answer. And he did. And that was uh, an all-star team. Uh, both Michael Spinks and his brother were on that team and Sugar Ray Leonard. And he said, a lot of boxers aren't really close, but he said, we were. We all became friends, and we were all cheering for each other. It was a, it was a really close team. He was from Rhode Island. I mean, he was. Glenn Cole, right? He's from Rhode Island. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, okay, yeah, that's where he was from. And he's in Florida now, yeah. and uh, this gym in Flo Florida that he went to, he's the head boxing coach. By the way, the uh, Jeff, the person before I mentioned, he wanted to give a, a boxing a shot, and he said to Howard, would you train me? I want to try to be a pro heavyweight. And Howard did, and um, Jeff was um, had a draw on the first one. The, the second one, he knocked the guy out, and the third one, it was a decision. And then he said, well, I want to do mixed martial arts. So I think uh, I just wanted to try it. <laughs> and this is probably the most well-known person in my book, Jerry Cooney, mm -hmm. also from Long yeah, Island. From, but uh, right, but living in New Jersey now. He was real close to being the champ. He fought Larry Holmes for the championship. He was only 25. He really wasn't ready. And he explained that um, he and his manager never signed up with Don King. So everybody else got two and three fights a year. He, um, his last fight before Larry Holmes, he knocked out Ken Norton in 54 seconds. And he didn't get another fight for 13 months till he fought Larry Holmes. Larry Holmes is probably one of the greatest heavyweights we ever had. And uh, in the book he says that Larry Holmes and him are really good friends. And Holmes said, if you had another year, you might have beaten me. <laughs> and this is um, how I started the book with Chuck Wapner. Uh, he's a friend of mine. And um, I do things in the environment where people are. And this truly is, because he's known, also known as the Bayonne Bleeder. And um, here he still lives in Bayonne, in the condo, and right behind him is the Bayonne Bridge. Um, he's actually uh, the real Rocky. Um, Stallone went home after seeing uh, Chuck Wepner fight Muhammad Ali. He went 15 rounds, which very few fighters could say they did. And he did way better than anybody ever expected. But as they explained to me, 
he never trained full time. He always had a job. And he also um, never had the same manager. He had 15 people over the years training. So uh, he lasted the 15 rounds. He even knocked Ali down in one of them. And um, Stallone went home that night and started the script for Rocky. And initially he did give, um, they gave Chuck an offer. Uh, we'll give you 2% of the box office or 100,000. And he said, I'm a boxer. I took the 100,000. <laughs> Can you imagine what the 2% would be? Oh, yeah. So then later he felt that he didn't get his um, real due, and uh, he sued him, and it was a settlement out of court. And because it's clearly admitted in writing everywhere that um, uh, he was the real Rocky. Now, in um, my case, that's why I started this as a boxing fan and then going to Chuck's fights. When I wasn't <coughs> photographing, I, I would see things that were so fascinating to me, including his toughness. I, I didn't think it was physiologically possible to survive some of the bouts that um, Chuck kept going on. And one of them I was at was Sonny Liston's fight. Uh, by, I think it was the seventh round, Chuck's eyes were filled with blood. He, he really couldn't see, and he admitted later that Liston was just a shadow. That's all he could see. And he kept charging Liston. By the way, both of them had to get oversized gloves. Chuck is almost 6'6", and Liston, I think, was 6'1", but their hands are huge. And um, in what, the seventh round, the referee came over, and he saw this blood on Chuck, and Chuck makes the joke. He said, how many fingers am I holding up? <laughs> and Chuck's joke is, how many guesses do I get? <laughs> well, if he had said that, they would have stopped it. But his, his manager, Al Braverman, who was kind of a, a slick sort of guy, poked him three times in the back, and he said, three. He said, okay, you can go back in. So they let him in for one more round, and the doctor realized this has to stop, and Chuck needed se about 77 stitches. But he was angry that they stopped it. Uh, he took the uh, sponge that was full, full of blood and threw it at the referee, and the uh, press said the next Monday, they said, you know, the next time we go to one of Chuck Butler's fights, we're going to be wearing raincoats. <laughs> every time Liston hit him, there was blood splattering on our suits. It's an expensive night. <coughs> so I had that in mind uh, after the first book that I wanted to do something else. And I, it was an unrequited um, thing, too, of not photographing when I was in these Damon Runyesque scenes where Chuck had just won and we all go to a bar where Willie Gilsenberg, an old fight promoter, uh, had stacks of money on a pool table, and he's paying the fighters. Although, as I said before to somebody here, I might not have gotten those shots anyway. So I thought I would start with him uh, to do this. But uh, the other impetus was when mixed martial arts uh, first came out, it wasn't televised. And I was reading a photography magazine, and it was an article about a fighter, Tank Abbott, that a photographer was hired to photograph, and he said that he's fighting in the cage, and it's, it sounded barbaric and you know crazy, and it's it, something that would interest me. <laughs> and I said, I, I'd like to find out more about this. So I was renting VHS tapes of fights that already occurred. And uh, then my son got involved in it. He became a big fan, and it was a father-son bonding moment, so watching these. And then eventually it got so big they uh, were televised. And now it, it's outselling boxing on pay-per-view. Uh, I think in the 18 to 35 year old group, there's more people that watched uh, one particular UFC fight than they did a World Series games. And um, it's just really exploded. Uh, and then I had this curiosity. I knew Chuck and I knew he was a really nice guy. And he, he's done a lot of charity things after he retired from the ring. I know that Jerry Cooney does that as well, and including trying to start a union to get medical benefits for retired boxers. But I didn't know what the other people were, were like. And I s say to people uh, that are looking for those negative stereotypes of thinking they're thugs or whatever, this is the nicest group of people I ever met. Mm -hmm. To a person, they, they are just so nice and down to earth. One of the guys in the book who's um, he's in the UFC, Thiago Alves, his nickname is Pitbull. And I told him that, and he said, oh, he said, fighters are the sweetest people in the world. He said, I never get angry. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, they don't have anything to prove, for one, and I, if, you, if they're still <laughs> fighting and you work out as hard as they do, I don't think you'd have the energy to be angry. They also don't like bullies to a person, and I, I ask a lot of them, what do you do with these rude people in traffic that cut you off and say something to you? They say, oh, you know, one guy said, I, I wave at them and say, how's the family? <laughs> Another guy said, well, I'm not going to be in a fight with anybody unless I get paid. Another guy said, oh, I haven't been, I haven't been in a fight since third grade. And he goes to bars with his friends, and he said, um, I would be the ultimate bully, what I know versus what they don't know, plus they're drunk. So my friends say, listen, you don't really want to fight with this guy. Can we buy you a drink instead? And he said, that always works. <laughs> And then I have uh, several mixed martial arts trained bouncers that are really tough guys. Nicest guys in the world. They, they have no interest in hurting anybody either. They said, well, first of all, the goal is to get people out safely. The owner doesn't want you hitting somebody. And we don't want to be hitting somebody. Why would we do that? And um, he said, but when all else fails in diplomacy, what do I do to prevent a fight with them? If I see they're going to take a swing at me, he said, I put a mouth guard in. And they back off, like, oh my god, this guy really does know how to fight. <laughs> better shut up. My, my beer muscles have exceeded my uh, intelligence tonight. And he said, and then if it ever does get to be outside, one time uh, there were three bouncers and eight guys that um, got really tough because they drank a lot. And he said, uh, and then one took a swing at one of us. And after he was knocked out, nobody else really wanted a fight. They didn't, they didn't think it was going to go this far. <laughs> Are there any questions about either one? I'm just curious, is, are you saying he's friendly with Chuck Weapner right now? Is this yes. A, is he healthy? I mean, is he yes. from the effects of being Yes. I'm, I'm glad you asked that because um, I actually get this question a lot. Um, he's going to be 75 soon, and people think that maybe he's punchy or something. And I always tell them, he is more lucid than a 20-year-old. He's also very funny. Very quick-minded, and he's still working as a liquor salesman full time. Is he, have, is he married? Or is he yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, he's married. Um, adult children. Uh, he's doing really well. He's. he's um, I'm surprised they could beat him like that and over and over. Well, I, I said to him because th this was another one of my fascinations of, you know, again, I'm in here tonight. I'm afraid of getting the paper cut, <laughs> and, and these guys are going in either a boxing ring or a cage with somebody of equal ability in the same condition as them. And then there's all the, the ramifications of what can happen to you. In mixed martial arts, you can have a broken arm if they don't stop it too soon. Um, boxing, uh, you know, knocked out wouldn't be a good thing either. Or all those cuts. And, um, you know, he's in, in great shape. And I said to him, you know, I, I always was fascinated about the punishment that you took. And you, you just kept bouncing back. And he said, well, you know, part of it is the uh, ability to absorb a punch. He said, I have a, um, almost a 22-inch neck. And um, probably physiologically, the, the uh, veins that in your jaw and temple may be further set back than somebody else's that does get knocked down. But he, it never stopped him. He, he didn't fear getting hurt. He didn't fear pain. And when I got down to that question about fear with all of them, what they're really more afraid of, they don't, um, they're not really afraid of getting hurt. In fact, a lot of them are fighting with it.